If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 4. We're starting a new series for 10 weeks called Real Relationships. Really important series, and this is on every relationship in your life, and not just every relationship, but just real nitty-gritty issues that we deal with in getting along with everybody, you people close, people far away, people that we work with, people that we you know, come in contact with that we might have a real difficult time with. So we're gonna talk about real issues in real relationships. This message today is called The Secret of Successful Relationships. This is the most important message you'll ever hear on relationships, period, for the rest of your life. What I'm going to say to you today will have more impact on your relationships than anything you'll ever hear in your entire life. And I'm absolutely sure I'm telling the truth. Now this is John chapter 4, and this is talking about Jesus' encounter with a Samaritan woman at a well. Jews hated Samaritans, and this woman had failed five times in marriage, and she was now living with a man. And Jesus went out of his way to go and minister to her and minister to the real reason why she had failed in relationships. John chapter 4, verse 5. Jesus came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have well said I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. Now this woman was a five-time loser in marriage, and now she was living with a man, but Jesus loved her. And Jesus came to minister to her for the real source of her problems and why she was failing in relationships. And what he said to her is the most important thing that any of us will ever hear about relationships because he chose a well as the backdrop of everything that he had to say to her. Now, she was a social outcast. No woman ever would go to the well by herself for many reasons, for safety reasons, for social reasons, for many, many reasons. But no other woman would come and be identified with her because she was a social outcast. She was considered to be an adulteress. She was considered to be, you know, a five-time divorcee, and she had the lowest possible status in society. And she was there to draw water by herself in this well. And then Jesus shows up, and she's, she's surprised. And she says, why are you talking to me, a Samaritan woman? Because she knew that Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus then begins to talk to her about water. And here's what we learn from the encounter of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. And the first thing is our most important relational needs can only be met by God. They cannot be met by any person. Now, this woman, the reason that she was failing in relationships is because she was trusting in people to meet her deepest needs in life. And they simply couldn't realize when she uh, exposes herself to Jesus as having had five husbands and now living with a man, Jesus does not say to her, you chose five duds. You just happen to be a very unlucky woman and you've just always chosen bad men. And some women would feel that way. Some men would feel that way. I've always had, you know, chosen bad women. Or some women would say, I've chosen bad men. Or some people would say, I've just had bad friends or had bad luck in relationships. But Jesus never says, the men in your life have been your problem. What he says to her is, lady, you're digging and you're drinking from the wrong well. You're expecting people 
to do for you what they simply can't do. And I just want us to take us back for just a minute to the beginning of creation. When God created Adam and Eve, it was never God's design that they would live without him. It wasn't Adam and Eve, it was Adam and Eve and God in the Garden of Eden. And God intended for him to be at the center of all human relationships for all of eternity. But when they sinned, they lost their relationship with God. And not only could they not get along anymore, by Genesis 6, God regretted that he had made man on the earth and man became violent and immoral because we no longer had God at the center of our relationships. Only God can meet our deepest needs. And here are our four deepest needs. Now, whether you realize it or not, this is the operating system that runs in the background of your life every day. When you wake up every single day, when I wake up every single day, there are four deep, deep needs that we're all trying to get met. And we're either gonna get these needs met from people or we're gonna get them met by God. In fact, you're gonna try to get them met from people, but you won't get them met from people. This is what she was doing wrong. Here are four deepest needs. Acceptance, identity, security, and purpose. That's what we live to get met in our lives. Acceptance. I want to be accepted, but I don't want to be accepted because my teeth are white enough and my deodorant is releasing properly. I want to be accepted for who I am. And I don't just want to be accepted on my good days when I'm doing well. I want to be accepted on my bad days when I'm not doing well. And there's only one person that can be trusted to do that, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. People simply cannot be trusted to always love us because they don't. Even the people closest to us, the people that we love the most, they can't always meet our needs for acceptance. But here's what God says. God says in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. The word leave means physical, the word forsake means emotional. You can forsake a person that you're sitting right next to. You can forsake a person that you're in proximity to all the time. In other words, I haven't physically left you, but I've turned my heart away. God says this, in all of eternity, I will never leave your presence and I'll never turn my heart away. You know, the thing that gives me hope, the, the, sto- the story of the Samaritan woman, the thing that gives me hope is the fact that Jesus loves a woman like that. It doesn't give you hope. I, I love the way that God loves people and God doesn't throw people away and God doesn't reject us just because we've had a string of bad luck or something's gone wrong. On your worst day, he's still your best friend. And when everyone else has rejected you, Jesus will never reject you. And he is the only person that can be trusted to meet our need for acceptance. Identity. I want to feel like I'm someone special. I want to, I want to feel like that, that I know who I am and it's significant in life. But here's the problem. God made me in my mother's womb and he's the only person who knows who I am. Did you know in Revelation 2.17, God says to him who overcomes, when we get to heaven one day, he's going to give us a white stone with our real name on it. Did you know when you were in your mother's womb, God named you? And the name that you have right now is not your real name. There may be many other people that have your name in in this life. But no one has your name in heaven. And no one has your name with God. You have an identity that God knows and only God can tell you who you really are. Two weeks after I got saved. And by the way, Karen and I's anniversary is in a couple of days. We were married May 11th of 1904. 1973. We celebrate our 37th anniversary this week. And uh, so... And she, she's the best wife and mother in the whole world. And uh, I have been blessed to be married to her for 37 years, but I got saved a week before I got married. So this, this week is the anniversary of me getting saved 37 years ago. And two weeks after I got saved, that's when the Lord called me to the ministry and, and showed me that I was a preacher. I would have never, in a, and when he showed me I was a preacher, I had hair down to here, blonde hair down to here, smoking a Marlboro cigarette in my backyard. He said, buddy, you're not a thug, you're a preacher. And I thought, well, I sure thought I was a thug. (laughs) It's worked well so far. But in my mother's womb, God didn't make me to be a a hood or, or something else. God made me to be a preacher, but no human being could have ever told me that. Only God could have told me that. Did you know that when you were in your mother's womb that he named you and he gave you a purpose? People can only tell you who they want you to be or who they think you are. 
But God can tell you who you really are. And when you hear it, it'll fit and it'll make you alive and it'll make you excited. Security. We live, we live in a troubled world, don't we? It just seems like almost every month now, things that happen before every five or 10 years are happening monthly around the world. Earthquakes and disasters and all kinds of problems and chaos around the world. And you think about physical security and financial security and all of that. You know, I don't know what's gonna happen next, but I know this, my God holds the universe in the palm of his hand and he can handle it. If I'm looking for the government to make me feel secure or people to make me feel secure, I'm just going to live an insecure life and a fearful life. But if my security is in God, he holds the future. He holds the keys to death and hell. He holds everything. He knows the future. There's not anything beyond his grasp. And so he can make me feel secure, but people can't make me feel secure. Not truly secure. And purpose. Why should I wake up again tomorrow? Some people can't find that reason. And they become very depressed or suicidal and they just think, I don't know why I should go on. I don't know why I should live. Well, if the reason for me to live is to make money, well, if I lose my money or lose my job, I lose my reason to live. If the reason for me to live is just to go through biological processes for 24 hours at a time until I drop dead, sometimes you just can't figure a reason to wake up again. But let me just say this. I was created by the Most High God and I'm His child and I'm a part of His army. And I don't live just to make a buck and spend it or to go through a biological process for 24 more hours. I live to make an eternal difference in this world and the lives of precious human beings. And that's why I live and that's why I wake up. And it's worth it. Acceptance, identity, security, and purpose. It is the operating system of our life. And we are being driven every single day to get those needs met. And so was the woman at the well. The only problem is she was trying to get those needs met by people. And when she had her first husband, she wanted him to make her feel accepted and, and special and secure and all of those things. And I'm not saying that people don't meet any of our needs. Certainly they do. But people meet our secondary needs, not our primary needs. And Karen and I had a, a terrible marriage when we first got married because even though we were both saved, we didn't know how to trust Jesus to meet each other's needs. So we put that pressure on each other. And what we found out is we couldn't meet those needs in each other. Only God could. And I'm saying to you, God can meet your deepest needs. And Jesus, here's what he said to that woman. Woman, if you keep drinking from that well, you're going to keep being thirsty. But if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would ask me and I would give you living water and you would never be thirsty again. Isn't that a wonderful promise? And that would become in you a well of living water springing up into life eternal. That's what Jesus said. Here's another thing that, that Jesus does when we have a relationship with him. He meets our deepest needs, but he also empowers us to love people. Galatians 5, 22, 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. Leave those up for just a second, guys. The fruit of the Spirit, this is when, when God is in our lives, the, the fruit of that is, the, what happens because he's in our lives and we're trusting him is love. We can't love without God. Human love is just a very shallow kind of, of humanistic love. But true love only comes from God. Joy, it, it's, happiness is depending on happenings, it's circumstantial. Joy is abiding. You can have joy on your worst day. Because the Holy Spirit can give you God's perspective even when you're working through tough times. Peace. You're either a peacemaker or a troublemaker. You only give away what you have. And if you're full of peace, you give away peace. If you're full of trouble, you give away trouble. And so God gives us peace so we can be peacemakers and full of his peace. Long-suffering. Kindness. It's so important to be kind to people. Goodness. Faithfulness. Gentleness. Self-control. All of those things, that's who you want to be married to. That's who your spouse wants to be married to. Those are the friends that you want. Those are the relationships that you want, but they only come from God. Our, our emotions are like an engine that are designed to operate with the oil of the Holy Spirit flowing through them. And when the Holy Spirit's flowing through you, you can just do anything relationally. It's amazing how powerful we are in relationships under the influence of the Holy Spirit. But like your car, when your car engine runs out of oil, it overheats and damages itself very quickly. And it can't operate without oil. 
That's exactly the way our emotions are. Without the Holy Spirit, we overheat and damage ourselves and others, and we simply can't operate. And the Samaritan woman was a broken down wreck of a woman. And she was damaged and hopeless, and she had damaged other people. And she had now become a social outcast, and her dreams were all broken because she didn't have God in her life. And Jesus came to her and said, Lady, you're, you're just simply drinking from the wrong well. But if you would ask me for a drink, I would come in and you would begin to function the way that you were designed to function. Before the fruits of the Spirit are listed, this is what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 5. I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lewdness. So stop right there and say, if you're not walking under the power of the Spirit, you'll have sexual problems. Sexual immorality and sexual problems are um, evidences of the fact that we're walking in the power of our flesh and not the power of the Spirit. Idolatry, sorcery, spiritual problems. Hatred, contentions, jealousies and outbursts of wrath, emotional problems, selfish ambitions and dissensions, relational problems, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, behavioral problems, and the like, which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, so on and so forth. The Apostle Paul says there are only two choices. You can walk by the Spirit or walk by the flesh. And walking by the flesh just means your own abilities and power. The ability that you have within your skin without God to, to try to make life work. And so what he says is the flesh despises the Spirit and believes that it doesn't need the Spirit. Our, our sinful nature tries to reject it, but the Spirit wants to overcome the flesh and to empower our lives. So these things are always battling in our lives to take control. The Holy Spirit wants control and the flesh wants control, but we make the decision. Every single one of us have the ability to make the decision to allow the Holy Spirit to control our lives. But if we don't, what he says here is we're going to have sexual problems. We're going to have spiritual problems. We're going to have emotional problems. We're going to have behavioral problems. We're going to have relational problems. Now, listen to me real, real quickly. I do not want to live the rest of my life trying not to do something that I really want to do. I want to say it one more time. I want you to listen real closely to what I'm saying. Hell is living your entire life trying not to do something you really want to do. That's hell, I think. It's hell on earth. I really, 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 really want to do this, but I can't do it. The Holy Spirit changes your wanter. And when he comes into your life, you don't want to be immoral. You don't want to sin. You don't want to hurt people. You don't want to do the wrong thing. And he not only changes your wanter, he changes your canner. The things that you couldn't do before, now you want to do and you can do because you got the power of the Holy Spirit in you. I don't want to live the rest of my life trying not to do something that I really want to do. I want to live the rest of my life with my desires changed and the ability to do the things that I desire. And only the Holy Spirit can give me that ability. And that's what he wants to do. He wants to come in and change our wanter and change our canner. But we make the decision, am I going to drink from his well or am I going to drink from somebody else's well? And every single day in our lives... We have the opportunity, we make the decision of whether we're going to depend on God and drink from that well or we're going to drink from a human well. And Karen and I had a lot of problems early in our marriage because we were trying to make other people meet our needs and make each other meet the needs that only God could meet. And we had all the relational problems and many of the things that are described there. That's the way that we lived for so many years until we learned that only God could meet our deepest needs. And so we, we learned many, many years ago that the first thing that we do every day is we have our time with God. Every morning, uh, Karen always gets up before me every morning. Karen beats me up every morning. Can you believe that? She beats me up every morning. Actually, even if I'm awake, I wait for her to get out of bed and fix the coffee. She's so good at it, I just don't want to break the rhythm that we've got going on. 
she's so good at it and so she, Karen gets up and makes the coffee and she goes into her place and then I wake up and get my coffee and go into my place and we stay there for an hour or two and the first time we see each other every day is after we've had time with Jesus it has saved our marriage and it has changed our marriage when you, when you have, the second thing that we learn from the story or of Jesus and the woman at the well is without God, our relationships are set up for failure. We'll never, we'll never make it. It's called the principle of transference. If I don't trust Jesus to meet my deepest needs, I automatically transfer the expectation of those needs to the people closest around me. And it sets up the relationship for failure. Parents, spouse, friends, whoever it might be. Every single one of us has tried to make a person into Jesus in our lives. Every single one of us. I've done it. And some of us right now today are trying to, to make a person meet needs in our life that they simply can't meet. Understand, when you try to make a person God in your life, you've put them in an impossible circumstance. And you're going to get frustrated at them, maybe even angry, maybe very bitter. And you're going to begin to accuse them. You're going to begin to put pressure on them. They control your moods because if they don't meet your needs, then your moods are bad. If they meet your needs, then your moods are good. You develop codependent relationships because you have unhealthy expectations, and so do they. Karen and I had a very codependent, unhealthy marriage at the beginning because we were both wrongly dependent on each other because we weren't dependent enough on God. But let me say this. You can... When you're in that kind of a relationship, you can only give to another person to the extent that they're giving to you. In other words, this woman was soul thirsty. And we're all soul thirsty. Every single one of us have a thirst every day for love and affection and acceptance and security and all of those things that people can meet secondarily. But only God can meet the deepest needs in our life. And here's the curse of not trusting in God and trusting in people. I can only give you a drink if you give me a drink. And this is the way many relationships go. My friends are people that give me a drink. And if you'll give me a drink, I'll give you a drink because we're both thirsty. And so we just sit here and swap water all day long. And the problem is, if you ever don't give me a drink, and you can't meet my deepest needs. The, the relationship is set up for failure because no, no matter how good your drink is, it can't meet my deepest needs. So I'm going to be frustrated if I'm depending on you. But my friends are people who we swap drinks all the time because we're, we're helping each other out. But people who don't give me a drink, I have no time for. See, I don't want to be the kind of person that only loves people that love me. Jesus said, if you'll ask me for a drink, you will never thirst again. And the water that I give you will become a well of water springing up in you to life eternal. What it means is you can go all day long saying, want a drink? I don't care if you give me a drink or not. You can be ugly to me, I'm gonna be nice to you. You can hate me, I'm gonna love you. Want a drink? Want a drink? I'll hand out water all day long because the source of my water isn't you. The source of my water is him on the inside of me. And I can be happy even if you don't meet my needs. I can live my life and I can be secure even if you're trying to make me feel insecure because people are not my hope. God is my hope. When we, when we live with our dependence upon people, we're unhappy, we're, our moods go up and down. When, the, when we lose those relationships, we're devastated. We are devastated because our, all of our hopes were there. You know? And here, here's a healthy saying. This is a very healthy saying. Life is wonderful with you. And I hope you're always around, but it's possible without you. Here's an unhealthy saying. I can't live without you. And many of us have heard people say that. I can't live without you. Well, you know, life is uncertain, ladies and gentlemen. And a lot of the people that we think that are going to be around forever are not. Life is pretty fragile. And there's only one person I can't live without, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so glad that Karen's in my life. I'm, she's a wonderful blessing to me, and I, I believe that I'm a blessing to her, and there's so many wonderful people that we have. But people are people. And you have to put them in the category of people. I'm so thankful for them. There are needs in my life that they meet, and they're a blessing to me. But life is possible without people, but it's not possible without God. 
And the woman of the well kept latching on to men, putting all her hopes and dreams in a man. And I'm sure she broke their heart, and they broke her heart. And she became hopeless, and one marriage after the next, one relationship after the next, until the point that she became hopeless. And now she was just living with a guy. This sounds like the United States of America to me. But Jesus showed up. And the third thing that we learn from their encounter is how to experience the love of Jesus personally. And here's number one. Remember that Jesus is a free gift. Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked and he'd have given you living water. Ephesians 2, God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved, but through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. We just have to remember, we're all messed up. We're messed up. We got problems. We got issues. Anybody agree with what I'm saying? We're messed up. And he's okay with that. When we wake up every day, your, your problems are your prayer list. The, second, the first thing to remember is he's a gift. The second thing is ask, ask what you need. Lady, here's what Jesus said. If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you'd ask. And he'd give you living water. If you knew how much he loved you, if he, you knew how gracious and kind that he is and the supply that he has around you every day to meet every need in your life. You'd ask, you'd ask. If you just understood how rich and good he is, rich in mercy because of his great love, has saved us by grace and it's a throne of grace and all we have to do every day is go and say, Daddy, I need more. I'm hurt, I need your healing. I'm confused, I need your wisdom. I'm weak, I need your strength. In every single thing we need, he's full of it. When we wake up and pray, prayers are not religious. They're just, I think they're very practical. My problems are my prayer list. When I wake up in the morning, there's nothing religious about my prayer list at all. It's just, Lord, I'm hurting. Lord, I'm confused. I'm going to have a meeting today. And if you don't show up, I'm going to kill somebody or get killed. Lord, I need your provision. I need... It's just real practical. And you know what I find? He is so precious. He, he is so gracious. And he doesn't love me because I'm worthy of it. He, he loves me because he is a phenomenal God. He comes to us right in the middle of our problems and circumstances, just like this lady. She didn't have to get fixed to deserve a visit from Jesus. In the middle of her brokenness, he was right there. And that's the truth for all of us today. But the thing I love about this story is the ending. And I'll read this from and will be dismissed. This is John 4, 28. The woman left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all the things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. Isn't it interesting she left her water pot? That water pot that meant survival to her before was now insignificant after she met Jesus. And she went to the leaders of the city, looked them in the eye, this outcast of a woman, talked to him. Verse 39, many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them and he stayed there two days and many more believed because of his word. Then they said to the woman, now we believe not because of what you said for we ourselves have heard him and we know that this indeed is the Christ, the savior of the world. Jesus in one conversation took a broken down loser of a lady and turned her into a world changer. And he'll do it for all of us. If you're drinking from the well of people, you're drinking from the wrong well. And you'll never have successful relationships because you'll be codependent, you'll be frustrated, you'll be angry, and you'll be empty. People are wonderful, but they have to be secondary. The well of Jesus Christ is the well that we drink from in order to get our deepest needs met and to prepare us to have successful relationships. Stand with me if you would this morning. And I want you to bow your heads if you would, and I want to pray for you before we go. And just bow your heads there. And let me, let me ask you a question this morning, and, and that is, 
Is there a person in your life, maybe today or maybe in the past, or maybe people that you are trying to get your needs met from in a wrong way? Kind of a codependence or a too, too dependent upon them. You're frustrated, you're angry. Maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's your mom and dad. Maybe it's your friends, maybe it's your boss, someone like that. Bow your heads with me if you would. Let's let God minister to you in this time. If, if that's true, you're normal. We've all done it. It's the natural thing that we do. We, a lot of times, just don't know any better. But it doesn't work. People are wonderful. But they're not God. They cannot be God. Even the best person in this world simply is a shallow well compared to God. And unless we're trusting God, we're always going to be frustrated. And we're never going to have the kind of relationships that God wants us to have. Worst of all, we're just going to be very fragile, dependent people. And we're not going to be the givers and the lovers that God wants us to be. Because God wants us to be able to give people a drink, even if they don't give us a drink. To love people who hate us, to bless people who curse us. And to be Christ to people. And we can't do that out of our own flesh. It comes from the provision of God. Are there people in your life that you have a wrong dependence upon? I'm asking you to rethink it this morning and to make a decision to make Jesus your source. I'm going to ask you another question. What is your relationship with Jesus Christ? If you don't have a relationship with him, he loves you. He died on the cross for you. He'll come into your heart and forgive you for your sins and give you the gift of eternal life and change your life today. If you're soul thirsty, he's ready to give you a drink. All you have to do is ask him. But many of us today are Christians. We're believers. We do, we do believe in Christ and we're saved on our way to heaven. But somewhere along the line in this dry and thirsty world that we live in, we've lost sight of the well. And today we're just simply reminded that he's with us and that he can meet our needs. Pray. Pray every day. Pray throughout the day. When a problem happens, don't pick up your phone. Pick up your Bible. Hit your needs. Lord Jesus, we come to you today. We make a decision. And the decision that we make is you're our well. You're well number one. You're well number one. And we thank you for all the people in our lives. People are wonderful, precious. But we release human beings from meeting these needs in our lives, these deep needs. We release them, God, and we bless them. Our mothers and fathers, our spouses, our friends, our employers, the government, everybody. We release them from the expectation of being God to us. And we come today, Jesus, and we ask you, give us a big drink right now. We're dry, we're thirsty, we're beat up, we're hurting, we're frustrated and we've sinned and we can't fix our problems but we're asking you to come today and to give us a drink of your Holy Spirit to coat the engine of our emotions to fill the well within our hearts with living water and we come this morning and we ask those things I bless this congregation Lord in the name of Jesus and as they leave this week I speak opportunity blessing health favor, promotion, blessed relationships, God, healed relationships, anointing, power, prosperity. I pray, God, that everything that Jesus died and rose again to give them, that you would open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that they could not receive. And that this week, God, that we would be sensitive to those that are hurting around us, that we could touch and help in the name of Jesus. Lord, bless us as we go. Bless all the moms especially in a very special way this day. In Jesus' name, amen. <music>